As a member of the queer community, I am passionate about both our history and visibility. Throughout my journey as a history undergraduate, I have aimed to amplify these voices. As a result, I wrote my dissertation on the Queer Britain Museum in London, in which I aim to assess how they represent queer and intersectional identities as a 21st century British museum space. I am so passionate about representing these voices that I'm currently pursuing a master's degree at the University of Leicester in Museum Studies, in which they are renowned for their research on queer and marginalised identities and community collaborations in museums and community spaces. So, what does this mean for rural communities around the world like Lincolnshire? Whilst this county does have a rich history, there are so many more hidden stories that have yet to be told in museums and community spaces. Therefore, it is important to discuss how organisations might use curatorial activism to collaborate with intersectional communities in rural areas like Lincolnshire to create a safe environment for all. There are so many examples of Lincolnshire's hidden histories. For instance, did you know that 550 air crew, a 6,000 ground crew of African origin, served in the Bomber Command? Did you also know that the Bishop of Grantham is the first bishop in the Church of England to come out openly as gay and in the relationship? I'm from Grantham myself, and I had no clue about this until I started my research for this TED Talk. Did you also know that in June 2023, there was a counter-protest led by the wonderful Lincolnshire drag queens against anti-transgender advocates. Over 300 people attended this counter-protest against this hate group, which truly demonstrates that history can be made in modern society today, and how community action is so important in rural spaces. Community is an important aspect to me, when looking at museums and community spaces. Communities are not separate, but always intersectional. So intersectionality means where multiple communities overlap, such as race, gender, class and religion. Personally, I have felt that communities have been viewed as distinct and separate from each other today. However, if everyone feels represented and heard, we can create a larger picture in which we're all just individuals who intersect into larger communities. When I think of home, I think of it as a, somewhere I live or a sense of safety. This is really important for museums and community spaces to consider, for visitors to perceive themselves in those spaces and to observe and discuss in them as well. It is interesting to note that Joshua Adair, who is an associate professor for gender and diversity studies, associates what home means in museums. Home is a center space where people could settle in whilst they create a living space within themselves and in the museum space. This is what I would like to imagine in museums and community spaces in rural areas like Lincolnshire, a safe home environment for intersectional communities. E.J. Scott, who is the curator for the Museum of Transology in Brighton, is someone who I'm heavily inspired by to undertake curatorial activism and community action towards exhibitions. Queer exhibition making has been used by E.J. and other curators to determine how we can storytell queer history to future generations and allow curators to disrupt argue and invent spaces. Collaborating with intersectional communities using queer exhibition making can help us understand how to use queer narratives for future generations. Therefore, these, these definitions will help us determine the next five steps organizations can take when collaborating with intersectional communities to create a safe home environment for all. The first step is to collaborate with intersectional communities on themed events in museums, community spaces, as well as other venues. 
This would foster a sense of acceptance and community collaboration we need in Lincolnshire and beyond. Arranging these themed events could also establish good connections between organisations and intersexual communities. Allyship can also be built from these good relationships, bringing together multiple communities to participate and display works in museums and exhibitions, representing marginalised people. Being an ally in these next five steps can create even more of a safe space for intersexual communities in rural areas. The second step is securing funding for small projects such as temporary exhibitions. This will enable museums and community spaces for visitors to see themselves in those spaces and observe and discuss in them as well. For example, organisations might curate placards and images from recent protests, vigils and marches that have happened in Lincolnshire and beyond to demonstrate they have been active in the present. You can also organise art competitions with themes such as a sense of belonging, community action, and so much more. These potential works of art could be made into an exhibition, enabling more visitors to see themselves in those spaces rather than feeling excluded. So temporary exhibitions are a good place to start. But as the word temporary implies, it means they're only on display for a limited period of time. When I was researching for my undergraduate dissertation, I found that quite a few queer exhibitions have only been on display during Pride Month or LGBTQ plus History Month when they deserve to be celebrated all year round. So how about further ways for people to perceive themselves and create an inclusive space within museums and communities? Adding Intersectional narratives into existing exhibitions is a great place to consider, making this the third step that organisations should use when collaborating with intersectional communities. One example is Coring the Burton at the York Art Gallery. So me and my partner visited there a couple of months ago. Um, we had a little um, holiday to York, and we visited the York Art Gallery, where they had an existing exhibition already. And what they did is that they did a sub-project where they utilised queer narratives and interpreted the queer lens into artworks and specific contexts. So they queered a lot of artists and a lot of their artworks for visitors to feel their identities with these paintings. I found it really interesting that they collaborated with the LGBT forum to ensure that they create an inclusive space for the LGBTQIA plus community in the community. This really demonstrates that reinterpreting these selected artworks in museums and community spaces can create even more of a safe space for intersexual communities, for them to perceive themselves in those spaces for them to feel included, and for them to not feel excluded in spaces where everyone should belong. The fourth step is institutional commitment to represent and collaborate with intersectional communities. This is really, really important to consider. So I use Margaret Middleton's term of a queer inclusive museum. This guidance strives for representation accommodation and communication to queer lives and narratives in the museum space all year round. This framework helps us to consider how we can represent, accommodate and communicate with intersectional narratives, where this is so important for organisations to have this commitment to represent these kinds of communities. Particularly, representation should be also to staff members who work or volunteer in museums or community spaces. Staff members should also feel like they have an identity in those spaces and feel heard. Everybody needs to be represented. Everybody deserves to feel heard in these spaces. The last step is a crucial and unforgettable reminder for all of us here. Acknowledging and representing intersectional communities should be an ongoing process as society evolves. This, this should not be shaped by one week or one month, but all year round, 
We must ensure to go beyond these five steps and work more with intersectional communities and rural areas to create a sense of belonging, to feel included, and to create a safe space and a safe home environment for intersectional communities. To conclude, my passion for amplifying queer and intersectional voices have led me to establish the five steps organizations can take when collaborating with intersectional communities. This enables us to create a safe home environment for all and to enable us to create a sense of belonging and community collaboration we need in rural areas like Lincolnshire. So, if you want to collaborate with intersectional communities, remember these five steps. Step one, themed events. Step two, temporary exhibitions. Step three, intersectional narratives. Step four, institutional commitment. And step five, an ongoing process. Thank you.